Hey everyone, my name is Brady Whitten and this is The Word Meets the World for November 17th, 2021. So news headlines are full of stories of a sexual nature. And for the past few weeks, we've been exploring the complex and sensitive topic of human sexuality and sexual ethics. In week one, we talked about the fact that sex is a gift from God meant to bless us and to bring us joy. In week two, we talked about sexual ethics, the do's and don'ts of sex. And this week, we're going to explore what the Bible has to say about same gender relationships. That's our topic for this week's The Word Meets the World. So what does the Bible have to say about same gender relationships? Uh, as we begin, I want to just offer a few thoughts. First of all, I want to say a word to any gay people watching and their families, friends, and allies. Uh, as part of this conversation, we're going to look at a few verses, sometimes called clobber verses, so called because they're often used to condemn gay people and their relationships. And I recognize that these verses can be painful to hear, and I want to apologize in advance for that. But if we're going to discuss what the Bible says about same gender relationships, we have to look at and address these passages. I also want to say that I realize this is a very heated subject and that some of you are going to strongly disagree with what I have to say. That's okay. Uh, I remind all of us who call ourselves Christians that Jesus' command is that we love one another. So we may disagree, but we must do so in love. And then finally, just to set this up, I want to kind of talk about why am I talking about this subject? So I'm a United Methodist pastor, and a group within the United Methodist Church is currently planning to break away from the denomination. And the question of same gender relationships is really at the center of it in some ways, uh, and it certainly is the presenting issue. So it's an important topic for my particular tribe, and, uh, and I felt called to offer some thoughts on it. So let's get to the Bible. One thing we should know is that there are verses in the Bible that are used to condemn homosexual practice that are not clearly about homosexual practice. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19 fits into that category, as do 1 Timothy 1.10 and 1 Corinthians 6.9. Uh, and I would encourage you to do a little research around these verses and see uh, some other thoughts about what they might be about. With that said, the Bible does, in three specific places, clearly talk about same-gender sexual activity. And I want to look at those. Uh, so the first one is in Leviticus 18, verse 22. And it says this, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And the second one also comes from Leviticus. This is Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. And then when we get to the New Testament, uh, Paul talks about this in the book of Romans in the very first chapter. This is verses uh, 26 through 27. He says this, for, these, for this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way also the men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Uh, now, some who advocate for same-gender relationships go to great lengths to try to interpret these scriptures as meaning something other than what they say. And I want to say that I don't think that that's necessary or helpful. I think it's better for us to accept that the Bible says what the Bible says and to acknowledge that there are places in the Bible that do not speak favorably of same gender sexual acts. But does that mean that Christians can't approve of and affirm same gender relationships? I think the answer to that question is no. See, the Bible says all kinds of things that we no longer consider binding for Christians today. Uh, along with condemning same-gender sexual acts, Leviticus also says we cannot eat bacon or pepperoni. Uh, look it up, it's in Leviticus 11.7. Uh, we also can't eat oysters, shrimp, or crawfish, which for those of us in Louisiana, that's a big deal. Leviticus 11.12. 
Uh, Leviticus 19.19 tells us that we shouldn't wear fabrics that are of different uh, materials, and so no cotton polyester blends. Now, some listening will rightly say, but Christians are no longer bound by the ceremonial or civil laws of the Hebrew Scriptures, but we are bound by the moral laws, and sexual laws are some of those moral laws. And I want you to know, I agree. Uh, but that raises a big question. Who decided that? <laughs> Who decided that some of the laws of the Bible are no longer binding? Now, before we get there, let's look at a few more commands that many Christians accept as no longer binding. Uh, Exodus 31:14 says this, You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it should be put to death. Now, I know few Christians who are overly concerned with Sabbath breaking. And among the denominations who have divided or will divide over the question of biblical authority, including the United Methodist Church, I have yet to see one splitting over keeping the Sabbath holy. Uh, and this law is in the Big Ten. It's in the Ten Commandments. In 1 Corinthians 14, 34, Paul tells us that women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law says. Paul and Peter both say, that women should dress themselves modestly in decent, and, and decently in suitable clothing, not with hair braided or with gold or with pearls or expensive clothes. Uh, and there are Christian traditions who take these commands as authoritative and Christian traditions that do not. Which brings us back to the question, who gets to decide? Uh, and to answer that question, we need to look at something known as the Jerusalem Council, which we read about in Acts chapter 15. So you see, in the early church, there was already a debate about which rules we should follow and which ones we shouldn't. And the big question uh, in the New Testament is, do Christian converts who were not circumcised have to be circumcised? And we need to remember, circumcision was the mark of the covenant between God and the Jewish people. Genesis 17.10 says, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. But the early church was divided among those who thought converts must be circumcised and those who believed they did not. So in Acts 15, again in what we call the Jerusalem Council, they met and they decided. And I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but here are some highlights. This is Acts 15, 1. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And then verse 6 says, So the apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. Verse 12 tells us, The whole assembly kept silence and listened. Uh, and what they decided, they wrote in a letter. And this fascinates me. The letter is still there in Acts 15. And this is what it says. This is Acts 15, about verse 28. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well, farewell. So do you see what happened here? They decided that the Gentile converts to Christianity no longer had to follow all of the things that God had told to Moses. Uh, now I wanna stop here for a minute because I'm not saying that the Jerusalem Council intended gay people to get married. What I'm saying is they took it upon themselves to decide which biblical laws were binding and which ones were not. Uh, in fact, they say plainly in verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So, who gets to decide what rules and laws Christians must follow? Well, here's the answer. We do. The church, the living body of Christ on the earth. Uh, Jesus says it this way in Matthew 18, 18. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Look, this is a huge responsibility, and it's not one that we should take at all lightly. But as the living body of Christ on earth, we do get to decide. It's right here 
in Acts 15. And so there are some, and I count myself among them, who believe God wants the church to do something new when it comes to same-gender relationships, much like the new thing that God did through the church in Acts 15 when they laid aside many of Moses' laws. Uh, now, there are some who believe it's time for the church to accept and bless same-gender relationships. But rather than see this as turning from biblical teaching, I see this as turning toward biblical teaching. So in week one of this conversation, we talked about sex as a gift from God, not just for procreation, but for the bonding of people and for their pleasure and their joy. Uh, last week, we talked about the need for healthy and life-giving boundaries and the traditional ethic of the church, celibacy and singleness, fidelity in marriage. Uh, if you didn't get to see either of those, I encourage you to go back and watch them. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, Paul commends marriage to us for this reason. He says, if they are not practicing self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. And my question is, why not apply these same biblical principles to gay people? Why not teach and encourage the same Christian ethic in same gender relationships that we do in opposite gender relationships? What if we, the church, made the decision to extend the good and life-giving ethic the church has always taught to gay couples? Celibacy and singleness, fidelity in marriage. Uh, what if we were able to say to people who were struggling with their sexuality, refrain from sex until you have found your life partner? And then when you find your life partner, be faithful to that person. Uh, I believe this would be more life-giving than what the church is currently doing. I believe this would be more faithful than simply telling gay people to stop being gay. I believe this would be true to the sexual ethic we see emerge in the Bible. And I believe that this is what the Holy Spirit is calling the church to do. Now, like I said, I realize there will be people who will strongly disagree with me, and that's okay. Just promise me one thing. While you're disagreeing, please be kind to gay people. Uh, they've gotten beaten up enough. And to my lesbian and gay friends, I know the church has been unkind, even cruel at times, to gay people through the ages, and I want to apologize for that. Uh, I believe God loves you deeply and profoundly. I don't believe you have to stop being gay to live life with God and to follow Jesus. I believe the same ethic that has been good and life-giving for me will be good and life-giving for you. I really believe this ethic is a gift and a guide from God. Celibacy and singleness, fidelity in marriage. Now, I know to some of you what I'm saying may seem very old-fashioned, and uh, I've been called heteronormative by some people, but I'm okay with that. Because I've, what I've found is a lot of this old-fashioned stuff is actually really smart and really good. So I just ask you to think about it and pray about it. Our sexuality is a gift and a blessing from God. In some circumstances, it makes babies. But in all circumstances, it bonds people together physically and emotionally. And it gives us pleasure and joy. But lived out improperly, it can cause great pain and harm. And so the Bible points us to healthy and life-giving boundaries. Uh, I think we'd be better off, all of us, if we committed ourselves to teaching these boundaries and living by these boundaries. So what do you think? Uh, I want to offer a few questions for you to think about uh, on your own or maybe to discuss with a group. Uh, before we put those questions up, I do want to invite you to like and to share this video. And please like, subscribe, and follow First United Methodist Church on social media. See you next time, everyone.